fans. Hello, fans of Symphony Nova Scotia. We're so pleased that you're joining us here this evening with myself and Lenny Gallant. We have people that have tuned in, obviously, from Nova Scotia, from Ontario, me, Quebec, British Columbia, people in Florida, people in Boston, all over North America to hear Symphony Nova Scotia and Lenny Gallant perform this evening. And we're glad that you have tuned in. Um, Lenny Gallant is a member of the Order of Canada. It's part of the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. And his song, Peter's Dream, was inducted into the top 10 East Coast uh, songs of all time by CBC listeners. He has music on the International, has had music on the International Space Station. He's a multi-Juno award winner and East Coast Music Award winner, I think 19 of them or so. Let's have a big round of applause for Lenny Gallant, wherever you are. We can't hear you, but we know that you are clapping. Lenny, how are you? I'm pretty good. How are you, Daniel? I'm doing really, really well. Where are you? Where are you in the world? I am in Mulcarmel, Prince Edward Island, uh, the western end of Prince Edward Island, uh, just about 20 minutes uh, beyond Summerside. And uh, right on the Northumberland Strait, I'm looking over the Northumberland Strait right now as I speak. I'm, uh, uh, right beyond the camera, I can see someone out there fishing for bar clams, and there are three kite surfers out there flying through the air at the moment as I speak. Oh, that's fantastic. It's, it's, it's pretty cool to be here right now. It's beautiful and inspiring. And is that landscape, I wonder, has that ever informed your songwriting? Is that an inspiration for your songwriting? Uh, being in this in this particular part of the world, you mean? Yes. Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, 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 PEI is a big part of, of my experience, of course. I uh, uh, grew up here. My family is, is one of the two oldest families on Prince Edward Island. And so my roots go pretty deep here, and uh, yeah, it, it it certainly has a, a bearing on 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 a lot of uh, what I do. Right. So what what was it like for you watching this concert uh, from the audience perspective tonight? Uh, it, it's pretty cool to be watching it actually. Uh, I don't I get my my volume up in my headphones. Is that possible? So I can hear a little better my, of myself. Actually, but anyway, yeah, uh, I can uh, speak at a forte dynamic if you want as well. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what was it like to watch it? It's, it's very cool to watch it. Actually, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it it it's it's great to see it from an audience perspective. You know, we had never yeah. intended to broadcast the, the concert. We uh, it, it was kind of a, a last minute decision to put a camera in there right. and record it. We were recording it for archival purposes, but. Uh, it turned out, I thought, pretty great, and especially with uh, my sister's artwork up on the screen, my sister Karen Gallant, her artwork up on the screen. Right. And right. so it was nice to have sort of a, a, a the view of someone sitting in the theater to watch the thing and, uh, and, and to, to, to be able to sit back and enjoy it from, uh, from the perspective of someone uh, in the audience. It, it was pretty cool. Yeah, because we never get that, right? As artists, we're always delivering, but then to be able to sit back and see what you actually did is a uh, is a rare treat for us, I think. So we're so lucky we had that footage. And the art, can you say a little bit more about the artwork, maybe? Because it was so um, watching it, it was so beautiful the way that it like complemented the music and songs. How did the artwork come to be? Uh, well, that's my uh, sister. <laughs> that's my sister uh, Karen's artwork. Right, uh, Lenny, we lost your we lost your video. We can hear you, but we lost your your video there for a moment. No, I don't. I don't see you either. I'm not sure what happened there. It'll come back up, but keep telling us about the artwork. There we go. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Uh, my sister Karen, she's quite well known on Prince Edward Island. Right. Uh, she uh, has uh, been painting for, for quite a few years, uh, and her work is is uh, celebrated on in this part of the world quite a bit. Uh, she has an art gallery in, in Rustico, my, our hometown here. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, for the last five years, we had a, a show that we did together called Searching for Abigway, which featured her right. artwork and my songs. That particular song, that particular show was pretty much celebrating Prince Edward Island all in, you know, through my two songs mm -hmm. and stories that I had written and mm -hmm. paintings that she had made. And uh, it, it, uh, it ended up being quite a successful venture. We, we thought we'd run it for one summer. In collaboration with the Federation Center, it, it ended up. Now we we've uh, had run it for five summers and uh, actually took wow. it on tour, so it was, it was it was pretty good fun. Right, 
And there's actually a shout out that we're getting from Marianne Ward, who's saying loved, in all caps, loved seeing Karen's art with Lenny's fabulous songs. So having an impact. We're so lucky that we have that footage. You know, and that's actually one of the things, now that we're, we're all looking for footage of great things that we've done, right? Um, so we're so we're so happy that we had this available. And another thing that's happening across the world is that orchestras that often have not been releasing their footage for whatever reasons are now able to sit and watch themselves play with pride and say, oh right, and look back on the memories. So it's that that's another another great thing, not just for us, but also for for the orchestras as well too. So I actually, yeah. another question coming up here, are any of those paintings still available for sale? If somebody who saw the concert wanted to buy one, would they be able to? I don't think any of those are still available. Her, her work is snapped up pretty early in, in, the, in the summertime. Uh, right. But uh, she's, she's constantly creating new works of art and my apartment is full of her paintings. Every, every spring I get to see a, a whole new crop of paintings that she, she's put out and I wish I had more space in my walls. Uh, because right. she, she continues to inspire me, but uh, right. she'll have some. She'll have some brand new ones up this summer. So here's a question: In terms of the art and the music, which comes first, or is it both at times? Like, do you look at a painting and think, and I have a song come out of you that inspires it, or does she hear music and then how does that work, or how has well, it worked? Interestingly enough, you know, despite the fact that we did a show together, uh, we didn't we didn't actually create the, the work to, to, to complement each other. It just mm. happened, it happened naturally. I think there were maybe four or five uh, paintings that uh, I maybe or four or five songs that she bounced off with her paintings. Uh, and uh, the rest of them, uh, it, it, it just happened uh, naturally that she had them, you know, hundreds of paintings that seemed to blend really well with the songs that I had written. And, right. Uh, you know, so. It was, it was well, a, it's a it's a huge effect of having accident. right yeah it's a, it has a huge effect um and just makes it so much richer i think for the listener and, and for viewers as well so um what was it like for you actually let's talk let's talk about the concert that we just that we just appreciated and enjoyed what were some of the highlights of that experience for you as you think back because this was a concert that just took parts of that entire show so we didn't see the whole thing tonight we saw parts no. of that. what were yeah what were some of the highlights for you Yes, uh, it was just you know songs picked out here and there throughout the show, it, and it's obviously when when it started, it's not the way I would normally start a show, uh, but uh, of course I love the songs that they did choose to 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 uh, to play. Uh, some of the highlights, God, is it, there were so many. You know, there were times when I'm playing with that orchestra that you, you, you as Jeremy mentioned, you know, it's kind of like jamming with heaven. You, you would feel almost transported, you know, uh, uh, musically speaking. Uh, 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 I would. Uh, there were literally times when I when I was in the middle of a song and I would get the chills because of what the orchestra was doing with yeah. some of the arrange the arrangements where, where they yeah. were taking us, you know. And it, it it was really wonderful working with the the various arrangers on the songs. Uh, uh, a lot of give and take. I'm very fortunate in that all of the arrangers I worked with were 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 very open to to putting ideas back and forth. And some of them I. With some of them, I would sit right in the room with them, and we would talk about the arrangements, how we, yeah. we want them to move. With other ones, it might be on the telephone, or we'd send stuff back and forth. But uh, it was it was an enjoyable experience. And when you with the first time you get together with the orchestra and play the songs and hear the actual real instruments instead of a computer simulation or, right. or something like yeah. that, it it it, it yeah. is it is totally mind blowing to hear songs that you may have written at your you know at your kitchen table or or, or at a small studio, and suddenly you've got you know, 50 musicians, uh, beautiful, uh, the beautiful playing from 50 musicians, are, you know, lifting your song up. It, it, there's nothing like it. Yeah. So you said you get the chills. Let, let's talk about that as, a, as musicians, because I know, you know, when we're working with music all the time and every day, um, and sometimes fighting with it, and sometimes it, you know, sometimes the music wins and sometimes I win, you know, what, the chills are not something that, um, that I get as often as I used to sometimes. And so I, I'll say like the chills for me is you get like this tingling up your spine and you're just like, like, what is it like for you when you get the chills? Can you describe that, what that is like, what you experience when that happens? What is it like? Uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, how should I, uh, 
I, I, you, you feel tra- kind of transported, like I said earlier. You know, uh, one of my favorite concerts ever with this orchestra was we, we played in a, in a in a church down in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, uh, a number of years back. And on that particular night, it, I mean, it was it was pretty magical at Rebecca Cohn for these for these two shows that we mm-hmm. did. But the, something about that the, the night we played in that church in in uh, Lunenburg, it was like the the sound of the orchestra went into the very wood of the church itself. And it right. felt like the whole the whole church itself was was vibrating and, and, and creating music itself. And you, if you talk to anyone who was there that night, it was it was it was it was quite magical. There's no way to other word to, to describe it except magic, honestly. Right. And that's the thing. It's even sometimes when you do repeat concerts, I know I found this. Um, do one concert, you know, maybe six, seven, eight times, and it's the same. It's the same, and it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's great. But then there might just be one of those six or seven that just for some reason something happens and you can't really explain it it's just like it's live it, and we're there and it's 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 really really special and those are really absolutely. memorable moments yeah absolutely well i i often tell people that probably that that particular concert was probably the best concert i have ever experienced overall and uh, wow i'm i'm very glad it was with that with that wonderful orchestra you know right absolutely what do you what do you feel the orchestra, I mean, your songs by themselves are, your legacy, it speaks for itself. Your songs stand alone with just you by yourself. So what do you think it is that the orchestra adds or added to your music such that even you were completely loving it, basically? Like, what did it add? Texture, I suppose. Right. Texture and... and uh... You know, I'm, I'm fortunate that the arrangers that I work with seem to understand my music. Several of the arrangers actually mm-hmm. played with me uh, uh, in, in, in like, although we didn't perform the songs tonight that he arranged, but my, my violin player who you saw on stage, Sean Kemp, he did right. a couple of uh, arrangements for me with the, with the orchestra before. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, Chris Church has done some for me, right. uh, various players. Uh, but it, Chris Palmer, uh, who actually is a member of the orchestra, he's, he's yeah. a wonderful Just arranger. The and, yeah. yeah, and uh, he's a wonderful arranger. And we get to sit down sometimes in, in the same room and, and work on uh, uh, arrangements uh, together. And, and it's it's exciting. It's exciting to see it, to see it uh, take shape. Yeah, because you can actually, of, oh, go ahead. In the case of uh, 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 the arrangements for tonight, the, the first song you heard, Time Travel, was actually a bit of a collaboration between Chris Palmer and uh, a group of musicians uh, called The Fretless, uh, friends of mine who, uh, while we were recording uh, my last album, Time Travel, it was just by chance that uh, uh, they happened to be traveling through, New Bruns- or through Nova Scotia, mm-hmm. had a day off, came into the studio and, and, and performed this beautifully to that song and so when it came time to expand on on on, on those arrangements Chris took what they did and, and, and built it up for the full orchestra and, and really made it uh, made, made it uh, 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 wonderful for, for, you know it, with an orchestral arrangement right and he often gets he often gets um, singled out as one of our players who does a lot of arranging for the orchestra and everybody that works him often has many good things to say. Hopefully Chris is watching. Let's have a big thumbs up across North America for Chris yeah, and such great work. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the song God's Reply. Um, I think that, it may, and maybe, you know, you can talk a little bit about the words of that song. I thought that it was really apropos for the time that we're in right now. Um, yeah, if you just tell us maybe a little bit about the lyrics of that song and like how that song came to be. Uh, I, I ended up, I wrote that song, uh, I started it before I went down there, but I, I, I started writing the song and then I went to Nashville, got together mm-hmm. with a friend of mine down there, John Wiggins is his name, and, and we uh, got ourselves put together in, in, in one of those writing rooms down there and that's where we finished mm-hmm. it. Um, what can I say? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I like to think that that particular song is it's 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 not about God. You know, this guy up there with a white beard. It's just about the energy in the universe. I think, and mm-hmm. and uh, more of a, a spiritual a spiritual connection to the world around us. And right. uh, and uh, it's it's in one sense a love song. I think perhaps between uh, 
between a couple of people, but then someone pointed out to me, you know, that song can be a, a song between a mother and a child. It can be a song yeah. between uh, uh, between two two lovers. It can be a song between man and nature. You know, yeah. I like the idea that it's the kind of a song that you can interpret in different ways. Right. I, I, like, well, to you... think of it as, I like to think of it as a wedding song. To me, I think it'd be a great song at weddings. God, right. Yeah. I, I love the... Uh... What really struck, touched me when I was listening to it, um, not only the music, but in terms of the lyrics, is this appreciation for the small things, the small moments of love and small things appreciation. Because right now, so many of the ways that we are used to rejuvenating ourselves and making ourselves feel better and just, you know, taking your head to different, we can't do them right now. We can't do them. So we're left with these small moments, right? I thought it was such a great choice um, for, oh, thank for you. this time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It, you're not the first. You're not the first person to say that. That that particular song just seems to, uh, you know, with everything that's happened uh, in Nova Scotia in particular uh, lately, uh, I, I think we need uh, a, a song of, of healing and songs of um, uh, getting in touch with each other at, at, at a very spiritual level right now. And so, right. uh, if, if songs like that help out a little bit, then, then I think that's great. Well, absolutely, and it's beautiful that it could help then and also help now. And continue to help in the future. So, what are some songs of healing for you? Like, if you need music to heal you, what are some songs that you turn to, or some artists, uh, songs of artists? Well, actually, I've been listening to a lot of Chopin lately. Really? Uh, yeah, because uh, Patricia's son Julian is a very talented piano player, and he is he is uh, seventeen years old, and mm -hmm. he's totally into uh, Chopin. And so uh, we've been here. We've been hearing a lot of Chopin. And I've actually learned a lot of Ch about Chopin through through uh, through Julian. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm becoming more and more interested in listening to classical music when I'm when I'm uh, just relaxing. Well, you've come to the right podcast because <laughs> we will fix you up with uh, lots of links to more of our music. Are there song? So are, are there songwriters that have influenced you? That's always an interesting question. Who are some of your influences or some of your icons or, or heroes, people that you've enjoyed? Um, well, you mentioned earlier, it was mentioned earlier that, that one of my songs was entered in the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame and uh, Peter's Dream, the last song that was played. And I cannot tell you how much that meant to me because my heroes in general have been Canadian songwriters, especially. Uh, not, mm -hmm. not, only, not only, but especially because when I started writing songs, I was very much into Gordon Lightfoot and uh, Leonard Cohen, Neil Young, uh, Joni Mitchell, all of those writers on a more right. local level, people like Stan Rogers. And, and, right. uh, and uh, you know, so to have one of my songs uh, in a collection that, that w where their songs stand, it, 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 it was, uh, it, it meant the world to me to have that, that, have that happen. Outside of uh, the people I mentioned, you know, when I started out, I was very much into writers like John Prine, uh, you know, everybody, as everyone says, I'm there mm -hmm. too with Bob Dylan, of course, and uh, uh, just people who have a really good marriage of, of uh, lyric and melody, you know. Uh, right. And uh, I gravitated toward more toward the uh, solo singer songwriters, I think, in, in, in that respect. Everyone right. from Springsteen to, to Archie Fisher. I just, you know, if, if you've got a great marriage of, of lyric and, and melody and you can really tell a wonderful story, that's, that's going to make me believe what you're saying, you know. There's a quote, I think it's Joni Mitchell who said that, uh, her, she said something to the effect of all my songs are true, that they're not necessarily literally true, but the emotion is true. And I think that's very important with, with songs. If, if, if it's someone who has a song that you can make you believe that, that the emotion in that song is true, that's the most important thing. Right, that's, a, that's wonderful. So some songwriters, I know when they are writing a song, it comes to them all at once, the idea, the inspiration, others, take lots of time. Can you tell us like, what's, what's your process? Like how's the inspiration happen? What's kind of the process? How does it come to you? It's a very interesting thing. You know, uh, um, again, just quoting one of my heroes, I think Leonard Cohen said, if I knew where all the great songs came from, I would go there more often. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and it's interesting how some of your, some of the songs that you write that end up being the more popular songs, for instance, with me, uh, songs like Pieces of You or the last song you heard, uh, Peter's Dream. They are songs that people recognize, uh, 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 that I'm recognized for a lot. And 
And mm -hmm. I, I talked, uh, I found that both of those songs almost spilled out onto the page. You know, it, it didn't take any time at all to write them. And, and you kind of wonder, how does that happen? Whereas other songs you may struggle with for months before the song will be finished. And it, it's very interesting. I, right. talk, I, I talked to my, my, uh, my good friend, Ron Hines, about that, you know, that, in that he had written Sonny's Dream really quickly. That song came to him super fast. And, and uh, 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 I remember a, a, another story about Gene McClellan and the fact that he wrote the song Snowbird it, it kind of spilled onto the page and he felt he felt so guilty in his case because he had made a lot of money from this song that only took him right you know uh right. half an hour or something to write but his manager at the time pointed out to him he said gene you didn't write that it didn't take you half an hour to write that song it took you 27 years and and that's the truth right. you know it, it, it was right. all that time building up to the moment when that song was spilled out into the page that made the song you know all those experiences all that time of working with perhaps the craft, the other songs, uh, made you ready to accept that song and, and, and to be able to put it down there in, in, in a very short period of time. And so, you know, whereas it, it, it's an interesting process songwriting, uh, some of the songs you got to really dig and work hard to get there, you know, and, and you may end up writing volumes and then, and then distill that down to three verses in the chorus. Other songs, right. You know, occasionally, not very often, but occasionally you get that gift where, you know, where it does kind of spill onto the page and you go, wow, where did that come from? You know? Right. That's that wonderful. Much, yeah. That was very much the case for me with that last song, Peter's Dream, that, that kind of spilled mm -hmm. onto the page. Mm -hmm. And then, and look at the result, right? Uh, that song probably, like you said, just being the tip of the iceberg of all of your experiences up to that point. So I think you know we're getting close to the end here. Maybe we can take a couple of questions. Um, I have two questions right now. One is from John McLeod. And John McLeod's question is, does Lenny ever write a song that he can use in both languages? Or do some themes lend themselves to one language in particular? So question of languages. How do languages in your songwriting, French, English, can you just do a song in both? Or does one lend itself to different themes? Well, as some of you know, uh, I have I have thirteen albums out, and three of those albums are in French. Right. So I so I do have uh, uh, songs that are written sometimes in that have both in French and English versions. But it, it's an odd thing. It's really hard to say why. But occasionally you will have a song that is not translatable. You know, whether it's the theme or perhaps it's uh, uh, the way it's constructed, perhaps it's the way you you use the language in English that, no, there's no way I can translate that song. Then there right. are other songs, you know, I have written some songs in French first, translated into English and, and vice versa. With me, I'm more, I didn't grow up speaking French, even though my background is Acadian, so I'm more comfortable mm -hmm. with writing in English. So most of, most of the time, if, if there's a song that works in both languages, I'll write it in English first and then I'll try to Mm -hmm. find a way to, to, to make it work in French as well. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. That's um, great. Okay, thank did, you. Did I, did, I, did I answer the question? I'm not sure. I think, yeah, I think I think so. Yeah. I liked it. We'll see if John, John asks again. He wants to, us to go deeper. Let's we'll see if he writes back. Um, yeah, wait, okay, t time for a couple more. Um, what is the most popular, most requested song from your vast collection? What's your most popular song, would you say? Um, it's, it, you know, I'm very fortunate in that uh, we did a show recently for the National Arts Center online, which which is actually still online on Facebook if anyone wants to see it. But yeah. uh, we, we asked people to send in requests what they would like to hear us do on that show. And I could not believe how many different songs were requested. You know, I feel mm. very fortunate. I feel very fortunate in that uh, people don't sit, they don't all gravitate to the same song. And I like that. I like the fact that so many of my, so many different songs of mine are, are, are different people's favorites. But if there's a, a couple that seem to pop up more, I would say it's uh, Pieces of You, Which Way Does the River Run. Uh, these days, uh, Sequoia seems to be getting a lot of attention. A song I wrote about uh, based on, on uh, uh, the, you know, Sequoia trees, the, the oldest trees on the planet. Uh, and, right. Uh, and from my from my latest album, and of course Peter's Dream, I, I would I would say probably those four are the most requested. 
Right. So I have a question. I'm going to pop in because I'm the interviewer, so I can do it. Um, what is, how does your relationship to a song that you have to play so many times as a favorite, how does your relationship to that song change over time? Because people want to hear that, like, you know, you might play it how, like thousands and thousands of times. How does that affect your performing of the song over time? Um, yeah, just talk about your relationship to songs that you have to play over and over again. For example, Ina Klein and Nachtmusik, and or, you know, we have our own in the orchestral world. So can you talk a little bit about that in our remaining four minutes, and then, and then we'll have one final question. Yeah. Well, people sometimes think that you get, you know, that you must get tired of playing a song like Peter's Dream, but I don't. I, I, I get energy from the audience. If, if the audience is into it, I'm totally inside the song. Uh, I have to be inside sure. the song to be able to deliver it. I can't just deliver it by rote, you know. Uh, yeah. I have to be able. To, I have to be able to relate to what I'm singing to be able to to really feel that I'm that I'm I'm I'm, I'm giving something to the to the audience. And I try to go there every single time. And and uh, if if I like the song, I can I can usually do that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that it's it's very important to me to to be, to be able to touch something about your feel something about the way you were feeling when you wrote the song itself. Right. So can you tell us, this will be the second last question. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were feeling when you wrote the song Pieces of You? We've had that last, that second last question just, uh, just sneak in. Um, well, that, that's kind of a breakup song. Uh, so uh, okay. I guess I wasn't, I wasn't in a very happy mood. But I was already okay. uh, kind of rather melancholy, I guess. I, uh, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say what songs are what's what sparks various songs i think in the in the case of that particular song uh uh i, I don't know i had found a comb or something that was left behind from from a, a, a previous relationship and and uh and the song just kind of uh it it it, 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 it was a moment that 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 all of the other images just it it, it, it kind of started the cavalcade of images and they ended up right. in the song Right. All right, Lenny. It has been wonderful speaking with you this evening. We have one final question. Um, you know, we're in this time, of unprecedented, very different time, and many people have been, heard your music, this interview. Um, what, and they're wondering what's keeping you grounded these days? What ha has kept you grounded? What is keeping you grounded day to day? Um, yeah. What's keeping you grounded? Uh, well, uh, I would say, what what what's keeping me grounded in the last uh, couple of weeks is uh, my partner Patricia Richard, who you saw on on stage with us. Uh, she yeah. keeps me pretty grounded uh, here in in uh, in Western Prince Edward Island, where she grew up. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I would say just just keeping in touch with uh, with my son that that's important to me. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, through this period, uh, my son Tyler uh, and. Uh, my, my my family keep, keeping in touch with my family and during this time when we're you know kind of forced to slow down a little bit just paying a little bit more attention to what's important in life how important it is to try to get in touch with your friends i've been reaching out to friends i hadn't talked to for quite some time right uh these days and and, and uh things like that I, I i think that's that's the kind of thing that's keeping me more grounded that's that's fantastic Lenny, thanks so much. Your music has inspired um, so many Canadian, well, not only just Canadian people all over the world, as we've seen from people watching this podcast this evening. And that's because of years of dedication and work at, your, at the craft. Uh, thank you for being, for, you know, playing with the orchestra and bringing that to the stage. Um, and thank you for this interview, for speaking so openly and with such vulnerability and openness about how it is that you do what you do and and how you stay grounded and where the inspiration for your songs come from. Um, it's been a treat for me to get to know you and your music, and for sure a treat for all of the all of our listeners and viewers this evening as well too. Well, thank you, Daniel, and, and thanks so much to uh, Marty and the orchestra, everyone in the orchestra, and and I know it, it's it, it's pretty special for them to allow us to play uh, some of my songs. Uh, you know, publicly like this, and uh, so I really appreciate them uh, making the effort to, to, uh, to, to, to be able to take some of the some of the show, shows, some of the songs from what I thought was a very magical show, and and, and share them with everyone. Thanks so much. All right. 
So uh, to all of our listeners and viewers, please be sure to check our Facebook page and our Instagram page to know when these events will be happening. We are going to be with you, providing you entertainment and orchestral content all throughout the next months uh, in many different formats, many different activities, many different things that are still happening are going to and are going to keep on happening. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you so much for being with us this evening and stay safe and stay in touch. I'm Dan Bartholomew Poser. Take care. Bye-bye.